Hi, ENG1P1. Let's continue on here with our next section. The next section is section three, and it's going to include chapters 11 to 15. Before we get right into the text, let's take a look at the study questions here. Now, looking at the study questions can be a very helpful strategy tool for saving some time, right? So if we can just remember to read the questions beforehand, before we read the text, um, it'll give us a kind of a heads up of the answers to look for as we are reading. All right, so question number one here. Who is Penelope and how does Junior try to establish a connection with her? So we said before, if there are two questions, the first question answers the A part and the second question you use as your extension. So here we can see, take part of the question and we put it in the answer. Who is Penelope? Penelope is, and you explain who she is, and then you try to include two quotes. Now, because this is grade nine, you don't absolutely need a second quote, but if you can easily find one, certainly include it. The second question then is your extension. Junior tries to establish a connection with her by, and then you're gonna fill that in. Chapter 12, slouching toward Thanksgiving. How does Junior become friends with Gordy? What do they have in common? So again, we see here the first question is going to answer the A, and the second question is going to go and be your extension. Um, how does Junior become friends with Gordy? Junior becomes friends with Gordy by, now remember you're taking part of the question and you're putting it in your answer, including a quote here to back up that answer, and then you're going to use this second question as your extension. Chapter 13. My sister sends me an email. Summarize Mary's email in two points. Mary's email is about, and then you're going to include quote number one and quote number two. So two points. What is it about? <clears throat> and then you're going to put a little extension together there. I just need a drink of water here. Okay, that's better. Let's take a look at chapter 14, Thanksgiving. How does Rowdy's father regard the cartoon? Is this type of reaction normal in today's society? So again, we have two questions. The first question is going to answer the A part, answer. And then the E is going to, or sorry, the second question is going to be your extension with your proof or your quotes in the middle. So how does Rowdy's father regard the cartoon? Rowdy's father thinks the cartoon is blank. And then two quotes, if you can. Uh, this type of reaction is or is not normal in today's society because. So again, you are going to fill that in. All right. Let's keep going here. Just two more questions for this section. Um, chapter 15, Hunger Pains. Explain how Penelope and Junior are using each other. So Penelope and Junior are both using each other. Here, Penelope uses Junior for, and Junior uses Penelope for, and you need quotes for proof here. And then you need to come up with your own extension here, okay? So explain a little bit more about this, this scenario or this situation. Okay, let's take a look here at the second question. What advice does Junior give Penelope is it good advice? So again, we have two questions here. So the first question is gonna answer the A part, and the second question you're gonna to use to put your extension together. The advice that Junior gives to Penelope is, and here are the two quotes that you're gonna include. This is or is not good advice because, and then that's the end of chapter, um, chapters 11 to 15. Okay, let's keep going here with the actual text. If you have a hard copy, follow along in your hard copy. If you do not have a hard copy of the text, you are just simply reading along with me on the video screen. Okay, so page 77, chapter 11, Halloween. At school today, I went dressed as a homeless dude. It was a pretty easy costume for me. There's not much difference between my good and bad clothes. 
So I pretty much just looked half homeless anyways, look half hopeless anyways. And Penelope went dressed as a homeless woman. Of course, she was the most beautiful homeless woman who ever lived. We made a cute couple. Of course, we weren't a couple at all. But I still found the need to comment on our common tastes. Hey, I said, we have the same costume. I thought she was just going to sniff at me again, but she almost smiled. You have a good costume, Penelope said. You look really homeless. Thank you, I said. You look really cute. I'm not trying to be cute, she said. I'm wearing this to protest the treatment of homeless people in this country. I'm going to ask for only spare change tonight instead of candy, and I'm going to give it all to the homeless. I didn't understand how wearing a Halloween costume could become a political statement, but I admired her commitment. I wanted her to admire my commitment too, so I lied. Well, I said... I'm wearing this to protest the treatment of homeless Native Americans in this country. Oh, she said, I guess that's pretty cool. Yeah, that spare change thing is a good idea. I think I might do that too. Of course, after school, I'd be trick-or-treating on the res, so I wouldn't collect as much spare change as Penelope would in Reardon. Hey, I said, why don't we pool our money tomorrow and send it all together? We'd be able to give twice as much. Penelope stared at me. She studied me. I think she was trying to figure out if I was serious. Are you for real? She asked. Yes, I said. Well, okay, she said. It's a deal. Cool, 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 I said. So later that night, I went out trick-or-treating on the res. Um, it was a pretty stupid idea, I guess. I was probably too old to be trick-or-treating, even if I was asking for spare change for the homeless. Oh, plenty of people were happy to give me spare change, and more than a few of them gave me candy and spare change. And my dad was home and sober, and he gave me a dollar. He was, al he was almost always home and sober and generous on Halloween. A few folks, especially the grandmothers, thought I was a brave little dude for going to a white school. But there were a lot more people who just called me names and slammed the door in my face. I didn't even consider what the other kids might do to me. And about 10 o'clock, as I was walking home, three guys jumped me. I couldn't tell who they were. They all wore Frankenstein masks. And they shoved me to the ground and kicked me a few times. Oh, and spit on me. I could handle the kicks, but the spit made me feel like an insect, like a slug, like a slug burning to death from salty spit. They didn't even beat me up, or sorry, they didn't beat me up too bad. I could tell they didn't want to put me in the hospital or anything. Mostly, they just wanted to remind me that I was a traitor, and they wanted to steal my candy and the money. It wasn't much, maybe 10 bucks in coins and dollar bills. But that money and the idea of giving it to the poor people had made me feel pretty good about myself. I was a poor kid raising money for other poor people. It made me feel almost honorable. But I just felt stupid and naive after those guys took off. I lay there in the dirt and remembered how Rowdy and I used to trick or treat together we'd always wear the same costume. And I knew that if I'd been with him, I never would have gotten assaulted. <coughs> and then I wondered if Rowdy was one of the guys who just beat me up. Damn, that would be awful. But I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. No matter how much he hated me, Rowdy would never hurt me that way. Never. At least, I hope he'd never hurt me. The next morning at school, I walked up to Penelope and showed her my empty hands. I'm sorry, she said. I said. Sorry for what, she asked. I raised money last night, but then some guys attacked me and stole it. Oh my God, are you okay? Yeah, they just kicked me a few times. Oh my God, where did they kick you? I lifted up my shirt and showed her the bruises on my belly and ribs and back. That's terrible. Did you see a doctor? 
Oh, they're not so bad, I said. That one looks like it really hurts, she said, and touched a fingertip to the huge purple bruise on my back. I almost fainted. Her touch felt so good. I'm sorry they did that to you, she said. I'll still put your name on the money when I send it. Wow, I said. That's really cool, thank you. You're welcome, she said, and walked away. I was just gonna let her go? I was just gonna let her go. But I had to say something memorable, something huge. Hey, I called after her. What, she asked. It feels good, doesn't it? What feels good? It feels good to help people, doesn't it? I asked. Yes, she said. Yes, it does. She smiled. Of course, after that little moment, I thought Penelope and I would become closer. I thought that she'd start paying more attention to me and that everybody else would notice and then I'd become the most popular dude in the place. But nothing much changed. <laughs> I was still a stranger in a strange land. And Penelope still treated me pretty much the same. She didn't really say much to me and I didn't really say much to her. I wanted to ask Rowdy for his advice. Hey, buddy, I would have said, how do I make a beautiful white girl fall in love with me? Well, buddy, he would have said, the first thing you have to do is change the way you look, the way you talk, and the way you walk. And then she'll think, you, she'll think you're her frickin' Prince Charming. Rowdy. Let's keep going here. Slouching toward Thanksgiving. Uh, I walked like a zombie through the next few weeks in Reardon. Well, no, that's not exactly the right description. I mean, if I'd been walking around like a zombie, I might have been scary. So, no, I wasn't a zombie, not at all, because you can't ignore a zombie. So that made me, well, it made me nothing. Zero, zilch, nada. So again, we see some um, sharing of how he has, or he really feels like he has some low self-esteem here, like he's a zero, like he's absolutely nothing. In fact, if you think of everybody with a body, soul, and brain as human, then I was the opposite of human. So again, not even feeling like he's a human being. It was the loneliest time of my life. And whenever, sorry, and whenever I get lonely, I grow a big zit on the end of my nose. If things didn't get better soon, I was gonna turn into one gigantic walking, talking zit. And of course, we know he draws cartoons, so here's the cartoon that goes along with it. A strange thing was happening to me. Zitty and lonely, I woke up on the reservation as an Indian, and somewhere on the road to Reardon, I became something less than Indian. Again, his low self-esteem here, right? And once I arrived at Reardon, I became something less than less than Indian. So going to Reardon here really triggers his low self-esteem. Those white kids did not talk to me. They barely looked at me. Well, Roger would nod his head at me, but he didn't specialize, sorry, socialize with me or anything. I wondered if maybe I should punch everybody in the face. Maybe they'd all pay attention to me then. I just walked from class to class alone. I sat at lunch alone. During phys ed, I stood in the corner of the gym and played catch with myself. Just tossed a basketball up and down, up and down, up and down. And I know you're thinking, okay, Mr. Sad Sack, how many ways are you gonna tell us how depressed you were? And okay, maybe I'm overstating my case. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating, or maybe I'm exaggerating. So let me tell you a few good things I discovered during that awful time. Okay, so let's turn it around. He's going to try and turn it into some positives. First of all, I learned I was smarter than most of those white kids. Oh, there were a couple of girls and one boy who were little Einsteins, and there was no way I'd ever be smarter than them. But I was way smarter than 99% of the others. And not just smart for an Indian, okay? I was smart, period. Let me give you an example. In geology class, the teacher, Mr. Dodge, was talking about pe the petrified wood forests near George, Washington, uh, on the Columbia River. 
and how it was pretty amazing that wood could turn into rock. I raised my hand. Yes, Arnold, Mr. Dodge said. He was surprised. That was the first time I'd raised my hand in class. Um, er, um, I said. Yeah, I was so articulate. Spit it out, Dodge said. Well, I said, petrified wood is not wood. My classmates stared at me. They couldn't believe that I was, a contradic was contradicting a teacher, going against a teacher. If it's not wood, Dodge said, then why do they call it wood? I don't know, I said. I didn't name the stuff, but I know how it works. Dodge's face went red, hot, red hot, hot red. I'd never seen an Indian look that red, so why do they call us the Redskins? Okay, Arnold, if you're so smart, Dodge said, then tell us how it works. Well, what happens is, er, when you have wood that is buried under dirt, then minerals and stuff sort of uh, soak into the wood. They uh, kind of melt the wood and the glue that holds the wood together. And then the minerals sort of take the place of the wood and the glue. I mean, the minerals keep the same shape as the wood. Like if the minerals took all the wood and the glue out of a, a tree, then the tree would still be a tree sort of, but it would be a tree made out of minerals. So uh, you see, the wood has not turned into rocks. The rocks have replaced the wood. Dodge stared at me, stared hard at me. He was dangerously angry. All right, so which one of these pyrotechnic giants will, ex will explode first? So this is how angry Dodge, the teacher, was. Okay, Arnold, Dodge said. Where did you learn this fact? On the reservation? Yes, we all know there's so much amazing science on the reservation. All right, now this here is, I wanna point this out to you, this is an example of a teacher actually being pretty racist, right? Calling him down saying, um, there's not good science happening, right? He's making fun of them. My classmates snickered. They pointed their fingers at me and giggled, except for one, Gordy, the class genius. He raised his hand. Gordy, Dodge said all happy and relieved and stuff. I'm sure you can tell us the truth. Uh, actually, Gordy said, Arnold is right about petrified wood. That's what happens. Dodge suddenly went all pale. Yep, from the blood red, from blood red to snow white in about two seconds. It, if Gordy said it was true, then it was true. And even Dodge knew that. Mr. Dodge wasn't even a real science teacher. That's what happens in small schools, you know? Sometimes you don't have enough money to hire a real science teacher. Sometimes you have an old, um, an old real science teacher who retires and quits and leaves you without a replacement. And if you don't have a real science teacher, then you pick up one of the other teachers and make him the science teacher. And that's why small town kids sometimes don't know the truth about petrified wood. Well, isn't that interesting? The fake science teacher said. Thank you for sharing that with us, Gordy. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Dodge thanked Gordy, but didn't say another word to me. Yep, now even the teachers were treating me like an idiot. I shrank back into my chair and remembered when I used to be a human being. I remember when people used to think I was smart. I remember when people used to think my brain was useful. Damaged by water, sure, and ready to seizure at any moment, but still useful, and maybe even a little bit beautiful and sacred and magical. After class, I caught up to Gordy in the hallway. Hey, Gordy, I said, thanks. Thanks for what, he said. Thanks for sticking up for me back there, for telling Dodge the truth. I didn't do it for you, Gordy said. I did it for science. He walked away. I stood there and waited for the rocks to replace my bones and blood. I rode the bus home that night. Well, no, I rode the bus to the end of the line, which was the reservation border. And there I waited. My dad was supposed to pick me up, 
but he wasn't sure if he'd have enough gas money, especially if he was going to stop at the Res Casino and play slots, sorry, slot machines first. I waited for 30 minutes. Exactly. Then I started walking. Getting to school was always an adventure. After school, I'd ride the bus to the end of the line and wait for my folks. If they didn't come, I'd start walking, hitchhiking in the opposite direction. Somebody was usually heading back home to the reg, so I'd usually catch a ride. Three times though, I had to walk the whole way home, 22 miles. <laughs> I got blisters each time. That's a long way to walk for sure. Junior gets to school. All right, so he's drawing a comic about this. On Monday, there's no gas money, so he's gonna have to hitchhike to get to school. On Tuesday, uh, there is gas money, but the car isn't running, so he's gonna have to hitchhike. On Wednesday, Dad gives me a ride. Car breaks down, one mile from school, I walk and get to school 30 minutes late. So he sure is having a lot of challenges just getting to school. Thursday, mom gives me a ride, dad too hungover. Clink, clink, clatter. Thanks, ma. Cough, cough. And then on Friday, no gas money, nobody stop, stops to pick me up. The price is right. This is my new win, squeal. Walk home, watch TV. So he has no way to get to school, so he just ends up turning around, going home. Next week, start over, but in a different order. So lots of challenges here. Challenges that most of us don't ever even have to worry about. Anyway, after my petrified wood day, I caught a ride with the Bureau of Indian Affairs white guy and he dropped me off right in front of my house. I walked inside and saw that my mother was crying. I often walked inside to find my mother crying. What's wrong? I asked. It's your sister, she said. Did she run away again? She got married. Wow, I was freaked. But my mother and father were absolutely freaked. Indian families stick together like Gorilla Glue, the strongest adhesive in the world. My mother and father both lived within two miles of where they were born. And my grandmother lived one mile from where she was born. Ever since the Spokane Indian Reservation was founded back in 1881, nobody in my family had ever lived anywhere else. We spirits stay in one place. We are absolutely tribal. For good or bad, we don't leave one another. And now my mother and father had lost two kids to the outside world. I think they felt like failures. Or maybe they were just lonely. Or maybe they didn't know what they were feeling. I didn't know what to feel. Who could understand my sister? After seven years of living in the basement and watching TV, after doing absolutely nothing at all, my sister decided she needed to change her life. I guess I'd kind of shamed her. If I was brave enough to go to Reardon, then she'd be brave enough to marry a flathead Indian and move to Montana. Where'd she meet this guy? I asked my mother. At the casino, she said. Your sister said he was a good poker player. I guess he travels to all the Indian casinos in the country. She married him because he played, he plays cards? She said he wasn't afraid to gamble everything and that's the kind of man she wanted to spend her life with. I couldn't believe it. My sister married a guy for a damn silly reason. But I suppose people often get married for damn silly reasons. Is he good looking? I asked. He's actually kind of ugly, my mother said. He has this hook nose and his eyes are, are way different sizes. Damn, my sister had married a lopsided, eagle-nosed, nomadic poker player. Nomadic means he travels around the country. It made me feel smaller. I thought it was pretty tough. But I just have to dodge dirty looks from the white kids while my sister would be dodging gunfire in beautiful Montana. Those Montana Indians were so tough that white people were scared of them. Can you imagine a place where white people are scared of Indians and not the other way around? 
That's Montana. And my sister had married one of those crazy Indians. She didn't even tell her parents or grandmother or me before she left. She called mom from St. Ignatius, Montana on the Flathead Indian Reser Reservation and said, Hey mom, I'm a married woman now. I want to have 10 babies and live here forever and ever. How weird is that? It's almost romantic. And then I realized that my sister was trying to live a romance novel. Man, that takes courage and imagination. Well, it also took some degree of mental illness too. But I was suddenly happy for her and a little scared. All right, an excerpt from the book, The Stranger from Montana. Think you're so tough, Junior? My only sister. I want to have 10 babies and live here forever and ever, exclaimed Mary Runsaway. Darling, gushed, what's his face? Uh, their beer smelly mouths met in a big kiss. Uh, what I want, face to face. Burp, bleep. Well, a lot scared. She was trying to live out her dream. We should have all been delirious that she'd moved out of the basement. We've been trying to get her to do, to do that, to get her out of there for years. Of course, my mother and father would have been happy if she'd just gotten a part-time job at the post office or trading post and maybe just moved into an upstairs bedroom of our house. But I kept, I just kept thinking that my sister's spirit hadn't been killed. She hadn't given up. This reservation had tried to um, suffocate her. She kept, sorry, had kept her trapped in the basement and now she was out roaming the huge grassy fields of Montana. How cool. I felt inspired. Of course, my parents and grandmother were in shock. They thought my sister and I were going absolutely crazy. But I thought we were being warriors, you know? And a warrior isn't afraid of confrontation. So he thought, uh, to Junior, he's being brave. And this situation that his sister is in, he thought that was pretty brave too. So when I, when I went to school the next day and walked right up to Gordy the genius white boy, um, Gordy, I said, I need to talk to you. I don't have time, he said. Mr. Orcutt and I have, uh, have to debug some PCs. Don't you hate PCs? They are sickly and frag, um, fragile and vulnerable to viruses. PCs are like French people living during the bubonic plague. Wow, and people thought I was a freak. I much prefer Max, don't you, he said. They're so poetic. This guy was in love with com computers. I wondered, if, I wondered if he was secretly writing a romance about a skinny white boy genius who was having sex with a half-breed Apple computer. <laughs> computers are computers, I said. One or the other, it's all the same game. Gordy sighed. <sighs> so, Mr. Spirit, he said, are you going to bore me with your tautologies all day? Or are you going to actually say something? Tautologies? What the heck were tautologies? I couldn't ask Gordy because then he'd know I was an illiterate Indian idiot. You don't know what a tautology is, do you? He asked. Yes, I do, I said. Uh, really, I do. Completely, I do. You're lying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. How can you tell? Because your eyes dilated, your breathing rate increased a little bit, and you started to sweat. Okay, so Gordy was a human lie detector machine too. All right, I lied, I said. What is a tautology? Gordy sighed again. I hated that sigh. I wanted to punch that sigh in the face. Makes him feel stupid, eh? A tautology is a repetition of the same sense in different words. So a repetition of, of the same idea, but said in a different way. Oh, I said, what the heck was he talking about? It's a redundancy. Oh, you mean redundant, like saying the same thing over and over, but in a different way? Yes. Oh, so if I said something like, Gordy is a dick without ears and an ear without a dick, then I would be, then that would be a tautology. And Gordy smiled. That's not exactly a tautology, but it is funny. You have a singular wit. I laughed. And Gordy laughed too. 
But then he realized that I wasn't laughing with him. I was laughing at him. Oh, what's so funny? He asked. I can't believe you said singular wit. That sounds like frickin' British or something. Well, I am a bit of an Anglophile. An Anglophile? What's an Anglophile? It's someone who loves Mother England. God, this kid was an eight year sorry, an eighty year old literature professor trapped in the body of a fifteen year old bar farm boy. Listen, Gordy, I said. I know you're a genius and all, but you are one weird dude. I'm quite aware of my differences. I wouldn't classify them as weird. Don't get me wrong. I think weird is great. I mean, if you look at all the great people in history, Einstein, Michelangelo, Emily Dickinson, then you're looking at a bunch of weird people. So he's giving uh, Gordy here um, a huge compliment, saying great people are always kind of a little bit weird. I'm going to be late for class, Gordy said. You're going to be late for class. Perhaps you should, as they say, cut to the chase. I looked at Gordy. He was a big kid, actually, strong from bucking bales and driving trucks. He was probably the strongest geek in the world. <sighs> I want to be your friend, I said. Excuse me, he asked. I want us to be friends, I said. Gordy stepped back. I assure you, he said, I am not a homosexual. So Gordy here is taking this the wrong way, right? He thinks that Junior's kind of making a move on him. Oh, no, I said, I, I don't want to be friends that way. I just meant regular friends. I mean, you and I, we have a lot in common. Gordy studied me now. I was an Indian kid from the reservation. I was lonely and sad and isolated and terrified just like Gordy. And so we did become friends. Not the best of friends, not like Rowdy and me. We didn't share secrets or dreams. No, we studied together. Gordy taught me how to study. Best of all, he taught me how to read. Listen, he said one afternoon in the library, you have to read a book three times before you know it. The first time you read it for the story, the plot, the movement from scene to scene that gives the book its momentum, its rhythm. It's like riding a raft down a river. You're just paying attention to the currents. You understand that? No, not at all, I said. Yes, you do, he said. Okay, I do. I said, I really didn't, but Gordy believed in me. He wouldn't let me do up. The second time you read a book, you read it for its history, for its knowledge of history. You think about the meaning of each word and where that word came from. I mean, you read a novel that has the word spam in it, in it and you know where that word comes from, right? Spam is junk email, I said. Yes, that's what it is. But who invented the word? Who first used it? And how has the meaning of that word changed since it was first used? I don't know, I said. Well... You have to look all that up. If you don't treat each word that seriously, then you're not going to be treating the novel seriously. I thought about my sister in Montana. Maybe romance novels were absolutely serious business. My sister certainly thought they were. I suddenly understood that if every moment of a book should be taken seriously, then every moment of a life should be taken seriously as well. I draw cartoons, I said. What's your point? Gordy asked. I take them seriously. I use them to understand the world. I use them to make fun of the world, to make fun of people. And sometimes I draw cartoons, I draw people because they're my friends and family and I want to honor them. So you take your cartoons as seriously as you take books? Yeah, I do, I said. That's kind of pathetic, isn't it? No, not at all, Gordy said. If you're good at it and you love it and it helps you navigate the river of the world, then it can't be wrong. Wow, this dude was a poet. My cartoons weren't just good for giggles. They were also good for poetry, funny poetry, but poetry nonetheless. 
it was seriously funny stuff. But don't take anything too seriously either, Gordy said. The little dork could read minds too. He was like some kind of Star Wars alien creature with invisible tentacles that sucked your thoughts out of your brain. You read a book for the story for each of its words, Gordy said. And you draw your cartoons for the story for each of the words and images. And yeah, you need to take that seriously. But you should also read and draw because they're, because uh, really good books and cartoons give you a boner. I was shocked. Did you just say books should give me a boner? Yes, I did. Are you serious? Yeah. Don't you get excited about books? I don't think you're supposed to get that excited about books. Okay, so again, here we have an example of why some parents um, and school boards want to ban this book. Again, I just want to point out to you that the title of it is The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Would a 14 or 15 year old boy talk this way? Possibly. Therefore, it's absolutely true. You should get a boner. You uh, you have to get a boner, Gordy, Gordy shouted. Come on! So he likes books that much. That's a bit much. We ran into the Reardon High School Library. Look at all these books, he said. There aren't that many, I said. It was a small library in a small high school in a small town. There are 3,412 books here, Gordy said. I know that because I counted them. Okay, now you're officially a freak, I said. Yes, it's a small library, it's a tiny one, but if you read one of these books a day, it would take you almost 10 years to finish. What's your point? The world, even the smallest parts of it, is filled with things you don't know. Wow, that was a huge idea. Any town, even one as small as Reardon, was a place of mystery. And that meant that while well, Pennet, that smaller Indian town, was also a place of mystery. Okay, so it's like each of these books is a mystery. Every book is a mystery. And if you read all the books ever written, it's like you've read one giant mystery. And no matter how much you learn, you just keep on learning. There's so much more you need to learn. Yes, 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 Gordy said. Now, doesn't that give you a boner? I am rock hard, I said. I'm not sure I believe him. Gordy blushed. Well, I don't mean boner in the sexual sense, Gordy said. I don't think you should run through life with a real erect penis. But you should approach each book. You should approach life with the real possibility that you might get a metaphorical boner at any moment or at any point. So he's not talking about a real erection here. He's talking about um, getting a metaphorical uh, erection where you get that excited about reading books. Clearly, by Gordy's little section here, we see he really is um, excited about books. Okay. A metaphorical boner, I shouted. What the heck is a metaphorical boner? Gordy laughed. Oh, when I say boner, I really mean joy, he said. Then why didn't you just say joy? You didn't have to say boner. Whenever I think about boners, I get confused. <laughs> boner is funnier and more joyful. Gordy and I laughed. He was an extremely weird dude. But he was the smartest person I'd ever known. He would always be the smartest person I'd ever known. And he certainly helped me through school. He not only tutored me and challenged me, but he made me realize that hard work, that the act of finishing, of completing and accomplishing a task is joyous. In Well Pennet, back on his reservation, I was a freak because I loved books. In Reardon, 
I was a joyous freak. And my sister, she was a traveling freak. We were the freakiest brother and sister in history. All right, so here we go. Chapter 13. My sister sends me an email. So here's the original email. From Mary, Thursday, November 16, 2006, 4.41 p.m. To Junior, subject, hi. Dear Junior, I love it here in Montana. It's beautiful. Yesterday I rode a horse for the first time. Indians still ride horses in Montana's. I'm still looking for a job. I, I sent applications to all the restaurants on the reservation. Yep, the Flathead Res has about 20 restaurants. It's weird. They have six or seven towns too. Can you believe that? That's a lot of towns for one res. And you know what's really weird? Some of the towns on the red are filled with white people. Don't know how that happened. But the people who live in those white towns don't always like Indians much. One of the towns called Paulson tried to secede. That means quit. I looked it up from the res. Really, it was like the Civil War. Even though the town is in the middle of the res, the white folks in it, or sorry, in that town, decided they didn't want to be part of the res. Crazy. But most of the people here are nice, the whites and Indians. And you know the best part? There's this really great hotel where hubby and I had our first honeymoon, or had our honeymoon. It's on Flathead Lake and we had a suite, a hotel room with its own separate bedroom. And there was a phone in the bathroom. Really? I could have called you from the from the bathhouse. Sorry, from the bathroom. But that's not even the most crazy part. We decided to order room service to have the food delivered to our room. And guess what they had on the menu? Indian fry bread. In our in Canada, we call this bannock. Yep, for five dollars you could get fry bread. Crazy. So I ordered up two pieces. I didn't think it would be any good especially not as good as grandma's. But let me tell you, it was great. Almost as good as grandma's. And they have the fry bread on this fancy plate. Um, and so I ate it with this fancy fork and knife. And I just kept imagining there was some flathead Indian grandma in the kitchen just making fry bread for all the room service people. It was a dream come true. I love my life. I love my husband. I love Montana. I love you, your sis, Mary. All right, Thanksgiving. It was a snowless Thanksgiving. We had turkey and mom cooked it perfectly. We also had mashed potatoes, gravy, green beans, corn, uh, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie. It was a feast. I always think it's funny when Indians celebrate Thanksgiving. Oops. I mean, sure, the Indians and pilgrims were best friends during that first Thanksgiving, but a few years later, the pilgrims were shooting Indians. So I'm never quite sure why we eat turkey like everybody else. Hey, Dad, I said, what do Indians have to be so thankful for? We should give thanks that they didn't kill all of us. We laughed like crazy. It was a good day. Dad was sober. Mom was getting ready to nap. Grandma was already napping. But I missed Rowdy. I kept looking at the door. For the last 10 years, he'd always come over to the house to have a pumpkin pie eating contest with me. I missed him. So I drew a cartoon of Rowdy and me like we used to be, like superheroes here, right? When I put on my shoes, my coat and shoes, then I put on my coat and shoes, walked over to Rowdy's house and knocked on the door. Now this might be a dangerous thing, right? He doesn't know, you know, if Rowdy still hates him or not. Rowdy's dad, drunk as usual, opened the door. Junior, he said, what do you want? Is Rowdy home? Nope. Oh well, I drew this for him. Can you give it to him? 
Rowdy's dad took the cartoon and stared at it for a while. Then he smirked. You're, you're kind of gay, aren't you? He asked. Yeah, that was the guy who was raising Rowdy. Jesus, no wonder my best friend was always so angry. Can you just give it to him, I asked. Yeah, I'll give it to him, even if it's a little gay. I wanted to cuss at him. Cuss means swear. I wanted to tell him that I thought I was being courageous, that I was trying to fix my broken friendship with Rowdy, and that I missed him. And if that was gay, then okay. Then I was the gayest dude in the world. But I didn't need to say any of that. Okay, thank you. Or I didn't say any of that, I said. Instead, happy Thanksgiving. Rowdy's dad closed the door on me. I walked away, but I stopped at the end of the driveway and looked back. I could see Rowdy in the window of his upstairs bedroom. He was holding my cartoon. He was watching me walk away. And I could see the sadness in his face. I just knew he missed me too. I waved at him. He gave me the finger. Hey, Rowdy, I shouted. Thanks a lot. He stepped away from the window and I felt sad for a moment, but then I realized that Rowdy may have flipped me off, given him the bird, but he hadn't torn up my cartoon. As much as he hated me, he probably should have ripped it to pieces. That would have hurt my feelings more than just about anything, <coughs> than just about anything I can think of. But Rowdy still respected my cartoons. And so maybe he still respected me a little bit. All right, and here's our last chapter here, chapter 15. All right, hunger pains. Our history teacher, Mr. Sheridan, was trying to teach us something about the Civil War, but he was so boring. Um, and monotonous, that he was only teaching us about how to sleep with our eyes open. I had to get out of there, so I raised my hand. What is it, Arnold? The teacher asked. I have to go to the bathroom. Hold it. I can't. I put on my best. If I don't go now, I'm going to uh, explode face. Do you really have to? The teacher asked. I didn't have to go at first. But then I realized that, yes, I did have to go. I have to really go. I have to go really bad, I said. All right, all right, go, go. I headed over to the library bathrooms because they're usually a lot cleaner than the ones by the lunchroom. So, okay, I'm going number two and I'm sitting on the toilet and I'm concentrating. I'm in my Zen mode trying to make this whole thing a spiritual experience. I read once that Gandhi... Um, was way into his own number two. I don't know if he told fortunes or anything, but I guess he thought the condition and quality of his number two revealed the condition and quality of his life. Now again, the title of our book is The Absolutely True Diary. And commenting about this stuff is actually like reflective of absolutely true thoughts of, I guess, some people. Yeah, I know, I probably read too many books and probably way too many books about number two. But it's all important, okay? So I finish, flush, wash my hands, and then stare in the mirror and start popping zits. I'm all quiet and concentrating when I hear this noise, this weird noise coming from the other side of the wall. That's the girl's bathroom. And I hear the weird noise again. Do you want to know what it sounds like? It sounds like this. It sounds like somebody is vomiting. Nope. It, it sounds like a 747 is landing on a runway of vomit. I'm planning on heading back to the classroom for more scintillating lessons about the, from the history teacher. Uh, but then I hear that noise again. Ugh. Okay, so somebody might have the flu or something. Maybe they're having, like, kidney failure in there. I, I can't walk away. So I knock on the door, the girl's bathroom door. Hey, I say, are you okay in there? Go away. 
it's a girl, which makes sense since it's the girl's bathroom. Do you want me to get a teacher or something? I asked through the bathroom door. I said, go away. I'm not dumb. I can pick up on subtle clues. So I walk away, but something pulls me back. I don't know what it is. If you're romantic, you might think it was destiny. So destiny, sorry, destiny and me lean against the wall and wait. The vomiter will eventually have to come out of the bathroom and then I'll know that she's okay. So this is his strategy. And pretty soon she does come out and it is the lovely Penelope. And she's chomping hard on cinnamon gum. She'd obviously tried to cover up the smell of vomit with the biggest piece of cinnamon gum in the world, but it doesn't work. She just smells like somebody vomited into a big old cinnamon tree. What are you looking at? She asks me. I'm looking at an anorexic, I say. A really hot anorexic, I want to add, but I don't. I'm not anorexic, she says. I'm bulimic. She says it with her nose and chin in the air. She gets arrogant. And then I remember there are a bunch of anorexics who are proud to be skinny and starved freaks. They think being anorexic makes them special, makes them better than everybody else. They have their own freaking websites where they give advice on the best laxatives and stuff. Well, what's the difference between bulimics and anorexics? I ask. Anorexics are anorexics all the time, she says. I'm only bulimic when I'm throwing up. Wow, she sounds just like my dad. I'm only an alcoholic when I get drunk. Like, what the fork? What the fork, dad? Uh, there are all kinds of addicts, I guess. We all have pain and we all look for ways to make the pain go away. Penelope gorges on her pain and then throws it up and flushes it away. My dad drinks his pain away. So again, yeah, so he's comparing uh, Penelope here to his father in that they're both addicts and they're trying to get some kind of pain away from them. They're trying to numb the pain. So that's how they're coming out the same. So I say to Penelope what I always say to my dad when he's drunk and depressed and ready to give up on the world. Hey, Penelope, I say, don't give up. Okay, so it's not the wisest advice in the world. It's actually kind of obvious and corny, but Penelope starts crying, talking about how lonely she is and how everybody thinks her life is perfect because she's pretty and smart and popular, but that she's scared all the time. But nobody will let her be scared because she's pretty and smart and popular. You notice that she mentioned her beauty, intelligence, and popularity twice in one sentence. The girl has an ego, but that's sexy too. So he thinks he's, he's really attracted to her. Yeah, the other side of the fence, so a romance novel. Still smells like cinnamon vomit, a stunning portrait of one boy's fantasy, compelling. So obviously a picture of him trying to kiss Penelope. How is it that a bulimic girl with vomit on her breath can suddenly be so sexy? Love and lust can make you go crazy. I suddenly understand how my big sister, Mary, could have met a guy and married him in five minutes. Sorry, five minutes later. I'm not so mad at her for leaving us and moving to Montana. Over the next few weeks, Penelope and I become the hot item at Reardon High School. Well, okay, we're not exactly a romantic couple. We're more like friends with potential. But... That's still cool. Everybody is absolutely shocked that Penelope chose me to be her new friend. I'm not some ugly muted beast, sorry, mutated beast, but I am an absolute stranger at the school. And I'm an Indian. And Penelope's father, Earl, is a racist. The first time I meet him, he said, kid, you better keep your hands out of my daughter's panties. She's only dating you because she knows it will piss me off. So I ain't going to get all pissed. And if I ain't pissed, then she'll stop dating you. In the meantime, you just keep your trouser snake in your trousers. And I won't have to punch you in the stomach. 
Wow. So, so Penelope's dad is obviously racist. And then, you know what he said to me after that? Kid, if you get my daughter pregnant, if you make some charcoal babies, I'm going to disown her. I'm going to kick her out of my house and you'll have to bring her home to your mommy and daddy. You hearing me straight, kid? This is all on you now. Yep. Earl was a real winner. So check out the racism here. Charcoal babies. and He's going to disown his own daughter. Terrible. That's a terrible thing to say. Um, okay. So Penelope and I became the hot topic because we were defying the great and powerful Earl. And yeah, you're probably thinking that Penelope was dating me only because I was the worst possible choice for her. She was probably dating me only because I was an Indian boy. And okay, so she was only semi-dating me. We held hands once in a while and we kissed once or twice, but that was it. I don't know what I meant to her. I think she was bored of being the prettiest, smartest, and most popular girl in the world. She wanted to get a little crazy, you know? She wanted to get a little smudged. And I was the smudge. But hey, I was kind of using her too. So here's the question. Here's the answer to that question about why they're using each other, right? After all, I suddenly became popular because Penelope had publicly declared that I was cute enough to almost date. And all the other girls in school decided that I was cute too. So again, she's dating Junior. She's dating Arnold to um, get back at her dad. And Arnold is dating her to become popular. So it's, that's how they're kind of using each other. Because I got to hold hands with Penelope and kiss her goodbye when she jumped on the school bus to go home, all of the other boys in the school decided I was a major stud. Even the teachers started paying more attention to me. I was mysterious. How did I, the dorky Indian guy, win a piece of Penelope's heart? What was my secret? I looked and talked and dreamed and walked differently than everybody else. I was me. If you want to get all biological, then you'd have to say that I was an exciting addition to the Reardon gene pool. So, okay, those are all the obvious reasons why Penelope and I were friends. All the shallow reasons, but what about the bigger and better reasons? Arnold, she said one day after school, I hate this little town. It's so small, too small. Everything about it is small. The people here have small ideas, small dreams. They all want to marry each other and live here forever. What do you want to do? I asked. I want to leave as soon as I can. I think I was born with a suitcase. Yeah, she talked like that, all big and goofy and dramatic. I wanted to make fun of her, but she was so earnest. She was so real. Where do you want to go? I asked. Everywhere. I want to walk on the Great Wall of China. I want to walk on the top of the pyramids in Egypt. I want to swim in every ocean. I want to climb Mount Everest. I want to go on an African safari. I want to ride a dog sled in Antarctica. I want all of it. Every single piece of everything. Her eyes got this strange faraway look, like she'd been hypnotized. I laughed. Don't laugh at me, she said. I'm not laughing at you, I said. I'm laughing at your eyes. That's the whole problem, she said. Nobody takes me seriously. Well, come on. It's kind of hard to take you seriously when you're talking about the Great Wall of China and Egypt and stuff. Those are just big, goofy dreams. They're not real. They're real to me, she said. Why don't you quit talking in dreams and tell me what you really want to do with your life? I said, make it simple. I want to go to Stanford and study architecture. Wow, that's cool, I said, but why architecture? Because I want to build something beautiful because I want to be remembered. And I couldn't make fun of her for that dream. It was my dream too. 
And Indian boys weren't supposed to dream like that. And white girls from small towns weren't supposed to dream big either. We were supposed to be happy with our limitations, but there was no way Penelope and I were gonna sit still. Nope, we both wanted to fly. So they don't wanna really fly. They want their dreams to take flight, right? They wanna go and get somewhere else. This ancillary tail, sorry, the ancillary tail feathers of the Australian tufted arnelope make this bird perfectly suited to long distance flying up at great altitudes. So they want their dreams to fly, fly away from that small town. You know, I said, I think it's way cool that you want to travel the world, but you won't even make it halfway if you don't eat enough. She was in pain and I loved her, sort of loved her, I guess. So I had, so I kind of had to love her pain too. Mostly, I love to look at her. I guess that's what boys do, right? And men. We look at girls and women. We stare at them. And this is what I saw when I stared at Penelope. Penelope in her dad's old hat. Was it wrong to stare so much? Was it romantic at all? I don't know. But I couldn't help myself. Maybe I don't know anything about romance but I know a little bit about beauty. And man, Penelope was crazy beautiful. Can you blame me for staring at her all day long? All right, so that's the end there of uh, chapter 15. The, um, the questions um, I'm gonna give you until, I'm gonna actually give you two weeks to get through these questions. Um, and finish this up, okay? So um, watch for the due dates and um, we'll uh, touch base next week. Thank you.